Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, it's time once again for Music Night at the Majestic, and with us tonight, Doogie White. Doogie, welcome to the show. Michael, it's lovely to see you. Tell you, you know what? You are our first guest joining us from Scotland. Okay, so, all right, so what, Sean Connery wasn't available? No, you know, somehow Billy he just Connolly, couldn't make time Billy for Connolly us. Billy Connolly wasn't available. <laughs> you know... Do you know what, Michael? There's been a lot of great Scottish rock people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you if you listen, if you're a fan of Robin Trower, mm-hmm. his greatest singer was a guy called Jimmy Dewar, and he was from here, and he was just magic. And um, and but he died, he died, uh, uh, for whatever reason. But there are so many. Great, great Scottish musicians, you know, whether it's the sensational Alex Harvey band or whoever it is, there's lots of great stuff here. But I'm very honored to be the first one with the Michael Boswell rock. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe you know some of my uh, my uh, relations there in Scotland. Maybe I do. Maybe I do. My um, I used the church that I learned to sing in was over here. And then there was a, a, a some houses, and then the Rex Cinema. Now you're old enough to remember Chesty Morgan, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, they lived in between that, so so all the um, so all the the good Christian people came out and walked by the Boswell's house and went, oh, and then saw Chesty Morgan posters, <laughs> which one of, you know, which shocked the entire nation. <laughs> uh, but, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But Tom Boswell and Agnes was his sister, and she was lovely. She was very tall and slim. I remember her very well. But I mean, we're going back to the early seventies now. But the Boswells, I remember them well. Oh well, good. Well, tell tell me this. You mentioned about you know uh, singing in the church. Is yes. that where was that your introduction to singing? Um. I suppose it was. I mean, I, I all, you know, I grew up, grew up in the sixties. Now, like guys, I, there wasn't much music in my household. You know, we, we were what, what's known as Christian brethren, and so we were not allowed to sing um, hymns because they were of man. We could only sing psalms, and they were of God. And the guy would have a, he would go. Once in Royal David, you know, it, it was all that kind of stuff. And, um, but that's where I first thought that I could sing. Then I saw the monkeys or heard the monkeys on radio and Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck. And, 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 and I just thought voices are great, you know, and it wasn't until I heard Richie Blackmore and, um, and that I thought, oh, guitar playing is great. But by that time, it was too late for me. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the monkeys because Mickey Dolans was recently a guest on the show. Oh, right. Okay. And uh, the what? one of the, the other guys that you mentioned is uh, we're supposed to be recording with him in the, in the near future here. So you're kind of ironic that you should mention them. Well, the, we, we got gifted, my parents and I and, uh, got gifted a record player. Um, and we, we're going back probably to 1967, 68. And, and the first single I ever bought, the first record I ever bought was Daydream Believer by the Monkees. And my mum bought uh, Ingebert Humperdinck, uh, Please Release Me. On mm-hmm. the B side, the flip side, was 10 guitars. I, you know, and... and so from then, I just love voices. I just love voices. You know, they they can be odd and weird, but if they if they sound beautiful to my ears, I love them. Absolutely. Now tell me this: uh, 
Daydream Believer was your first single yeah. that you yeah. bought. What was the first album that you hmm. purchased? Well, in 1972, just before schools broke up, something happened. There was a TV show called um, uh, Top of the Pops, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and they had Sandy Shaw and they had Tom Jones and Val Dunning and all these guys on it. And we always sat down at 7.30 at night to watch it. And that night, I remember it really well because we only had a black and white television. And this guy came on and he said, um, and it was David Bowie doing um, Starman. Didn't know what time it was, the nights were low, ho, ho. And it, and by the Friday morning in Scotland, and I think probably through the whole of the UK, the world had changed. He changed the world over here. And by Monday, because you used to go back from home on, Thursday, uh, on Friday, and then you went and got your hair done, and everybody turned up like this. <laughs> on the Monday morning, you know, <laughs> you know, we all turned, we all turned up like that, and that's what changed. That's what changed it for me. Uh, 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 and going back to that church thing that you were talking about, um, you, we had boys and girls. We went there, and 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 they listened to David Cassidy, Donny Osmond, Michael Jackson. We listened to David Bowie, Deep Purple. Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer, you know, that kind of thing. So it was very different. It was very different. And, 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 but l hearing Deep Purple for the first time changed my whole world. Well, that had to be giving that you wound up working with Richie. That had to be quite in uh, a moment for you. Oh, no, no. That was 20 years after I heard it. I mean, I first heard them play in 1975, and I joined them in 1993, 94. So 19 years. But what the, the great thing about Richie is that he was always prepared to take a chance. You know, it didn't matter. He just went, hey, actually, we'll replace Rod Evans with Ian Gillen. And all of a sudden, it was magical. Ian Gillen's gone. We'll replace him with David Coverdale and Glenn Hughes. And it was magical. Oh, you know, so that's what he did throughout his career because he 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 could find people who he believed in and then could give a launch pad to. Now, some of us made it, some of us didn't. Some did better, some did not. But Richie always had that moment in time when he thought, actually, for the next three years, I can just go and work with this guy. And that's what he did with me. And I was very, very happy and honoured to be, you know, there are more people have worked in the moon than have, than have written and recorded with Richie Blackmore as a vocalist. You know, there's, only seven, there's only seven of us, you know. Exactly. Now, tell, tell me this, Doogie. I had read, I don't know if it's true or not, but when you you had played a gig in London with the, uh, with Richie, and it, it wasn't too long before that you had actually been selling hot dogs <laughs> at that venue. Is that true? I knew you were going to say that, Mark. Hey, Michael, <laughs> I, knew you were, I knew you were going to say that. You know, yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. I was unemployed. I had no work, and I said, and, and and every six weeks you had to go down to the um, the centre to get your check for money, you know, which is a good government thing to give when people can't actually do can't work. And they said, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "I want to work in the entertainment industry." And they said, "Okay, we've got a job for you at Hammersmith Orion, selling hot dogs." <laughs> and I went there, and honestly. I went there and I had a, I had three months where it was magic. You know, we, I saw, because it wasn't music that I was doing. I was doing Asian films, Indian films. 
And so all these beautiful people would come in and dressed up like people you've never seen before, absolutely gorgeous, and go into the Hammersmith Odeon, 3,000 people, and sit and watch a movie. Or it was boxing, you know, and you would have you would have welterweight world hit welterweight fights or or whatever was going on. But it was not until Mr. Big or Extreme, I can't remember what one it was. And I knew I was in trouble. I thought, well, I'm in trouble now. Here they come. You know, here comes Ling. Oh, here, oh, God, here comes Dome. And they all came in, up to me and they went, hi, <laughs> can we have one big, huge um, popcorn with salt? Okay. And one with salt. And, uh, and they just went, and they went up onto the balcony. And they just threw all that shit down on me <laughs> the whole time. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. i got to leave. So I left. You know. And the next time I played there was with um, Richie, two sold out nights. That had to be pretty satisfying. Well, it was kind of weird because I could see them. I could see the popcorn throwers. <laughs> they got in for free in the front row or the second row. And I thought, does anybody know who the popcorn seller is now? I'll just go and buy some and just, and I was going, but so what I did actually is what I did was because it, I didn't get popcorn, but I, 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 I threw my dirty underwear. We've been on tour for months for about six weeks. So I just got a bunch of socks and underpants. I was going, there you go. Have this. And they go, hey, oh dear God. <laughs> You know, it's it's it revenge is well served. Cold, you know? Exactly. It was great. It was great. Well, t tell me this, dude. <clears throat> uh, one of the questions we we always tell folks, you know, who our upcoming guests are going to be, and then you know, folks send in questions. Okay. As you, you're talking about Richie, uh, we had a question from Mike, uh, who wanted to says that you know, Richie Blackmore has a reputation for being difficult. Is okay. that accurate, or is it just that people don't understand what's what's going on? Okay, so that's two questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's true. It is two questions. Um, Richie and I got on very, very well um, because, you know, he doesn't he doesn't suffer fools gladly, and he you know and and. If you're asked for the tenth time in one day, oh, why did you smash your guitar at the California Jam? You know, it, it just becomes tedious. But he's very, he's very smart and he's very aware. And I never found him difficult at all. Other people did, but I, I but him and I got on really well together. Um, I don't think that there are certain people he doesn't like, and there are certain people that he won't deal with. But I wasn't one of them. We got on really, really well until that one day when we just didn't. And <laughs> on that one day we just didn't, that was the day I quit. Sometimes that's just how it goes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, since we're you know, doing uh, viewer questions, uh, Justin wants to know, uh, what does Doogie think the key to a good metal vocal is? Hey, be... All right, okay. It's different things, right? Being in tune is always good, right? That's that's always important. And you don't have to be in tune anymore because the people can fix them, you know. But um, I like a good it, – it's, it's always been about – we did this earlier, right? It's about voices for me. I like voices, right? So I like Chris Cornell. Right, saw him twice live. I like um Jeff Martin from Tea Party. I think he's just blindingly brilliant. I always loved Ronnie James Dio and Lou Graham. And I, I, I think that some people and it's more apparent to me now when I'm listening to people um doing what they do. I never wanted to be Freddie Mercury or 
Ronnie James Dio or Robert Plant or any of these guys. I just wanted to be able to sing. And I think there's a lot of people out there now, and you can see it in bands that have lost their singers, that they go and they find somebody who sounds exactly like the person that was singing with. Now that, you know, I don't, that's not my call to say, but I, but it's very much, uh, it's a very much a business move as opposed to a creative move, you know, and, and, and that's what I've always, I've always been creative. So I, you know, when I go into any of the situations I get involved in, whether it be Schenker or Malmsteen or Blackmore or Alcatraz, I don't go in there and think, hmm, I better sound like hmm, 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 or hmm. I just go in there and do what I do. And it's either accepted or it's not. But with these guys who make multi-million pounds on touring and albums, they pick someone who sounds like who the original guy was. I'm not going to name any names. You know who they are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know who you, who they are. And it's great because if I go and see, hmm, or I want to hear the song sung exactly like that. But it's not creative. It's not creative. It's just, you know, it's like somebody wanting to go out and doing a Frank Sinatra tribute show. You know, Frank Sinatra was brilliant, and I love mm. him. I could never sing like him. But, you know, if you're going out and you're going to do a Frank Sinatra tribute show, go out and do it like Frank Sinatra. No point right. in coming up and thinking you're Robert Plant or Ronnie Dio to do Frank Sinatra songs. You know, so, so it's a double-edged sword for me, really. You know, I, I only sound like me. I mean, I've stolen from Lou Graham and I've stolen from Tony Martin and from Dio and from Gillen and, you know, from from Ripper and stuff, you know. But I but I've blended it all into me. And, 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 and either you want to hear me sing with this band or that band or whatever, or you don't. And honestly, there's nothing I can do about that. That's your choice. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you, since we talk about you know, di you know different styles, Frank Sinatra and stuff, we had a question from Leanne who wants to know, has Doogie ever considered doing an album in a style other than metal? Right, okay. Years ago, years ago, and I don't know how, how long ago it was, I was in... I was playing grass pop with Ingvi Malmsteen. We were we were we were guests of Iron Maiden and Dio, and and Ronnie and I and I, and I'd only met him very briefly beforehand, and he he, he was great. I loved him. And somebody's got a picture of me, Ronnie and and Bruce together, and I never saw it. And I was the tallest, which was annoying for them because <laughs> uh, I'm not very big. I'm not very tall either, but it was great. <laughs> But, but I was, I, 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 we were all sitting around chatting, you know, and Bruce had tried to do something different from Maiden. And unless you're a genius, right, and unless you have a following like Bowie has, David Bowie, right, unless you've got that or unless you've got something that Peter Gabriel did where he can move apart, everybody pretty much sticks to the genre genre they're in and i remember ronnie we were all we were, the three of us were sitting there and ronnie said don't try and step out the box it doesn't work you know you're known as a rock singer or whatever the genre is now you know that's where you're going to be known that's what you're good at just do that and and so I've written 150 solo songs, acoustic, piano, and, and orchestral. If somebody wants to put money in behind it, I'll deliver a, an interesting album for everybody. But until then, I'll just be metal. <laughs> hey, if it works, no reason to change. Yeah, you know. Uh, Although, I'd like, you know, I, be, I, I, I'd like to be Tom Cruise. <laughs> where, he, where, he, where he can do everything and make it a wee bit different. 
you know. There, there, there you go. Or, 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 or John Travolta, where, where it's it, particularly with Travolta, his personality shines through on whatever he does. It doesn't matter if he's a, if he's dancing or if he's doing, you know, like swordfish or or or, or pulp fiction where he's menacing. But music's not like that. Music's mm -hmm. not like that for people. The people want to believe in what you're saying. They'll take movies and it's a popcorn thing. They go, "Ah, oh, well, he was a bit of shit then, wasn't he?" You know. But with music, if they expect you to deliver something they can relate to, and that's what I try to do. Yeah. Now tell me this: Have you ever listened to any of uh, Dio's stuff from the like late '50s, early '60s when he was you know, doing the crooner pop? thing yes yes but i mean it, it, in the same way that that people try to say hey, jimmy hendrix was the greatest guitar player it doesn't work for me i mean i'm mm -hmm. too young to remember that and it's an age it's an age thing you know it's an age thing so i i have but i have to say that you know i loved ronnie when he was doing uh the butterfly ball or when he was doing the Kerry Lifkin stuff, you know, Mask of the G Great Deceiver. And, you know, he was brilliant in that album. And then he joined Sabbath and did arguably the best Sabbath album ever in Heaven and Hell. And mm -hmm. that's down to opinion, you know. And we know what opinions are, right? <laughs> Everybody has one. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the thing, the thing that impressed me, because I, I, honestly, it wasn't all until... You know, a couple of years ago that I had heard that early stuff that you know Ronnie had done. And I was really impressed at how smooth his vocal was, how well he did that style, and then how how much he could rock. Yeah. No, 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 no. He was he was great. He was great. He had so much control and so, but it's the beauty of the voice. It's the beauty mm -hmm. of the voice, and it's what the voice creates, right? Neil Young. It's not the greatest singer in the world, right? But what he does gives you something that's spectacular that no one else can do. And mm -hmm. Ronnie was like that. You know, the, I think I said this before. Everybody's out there copying Dio, Coverdale, Glenn Hughes, you know, all the great singers now. The people they don't copy are the ones that are unique. You know, Robert Plant, Ozzy, Dio. Uh, uh, sorry. Robert Plant, Ozzy, you know, these guys were unique. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's got their own take on Paul Rogers or David Coverdale or their own take on this. And and it for people who are not our age here, Michael, you know, what are you now? Late 50s? Yeah, yeah, just actually you just turned 55. But 55. the gray beard, the gray beard puts on another five years. All right, okay. All right, then okay. You'll be dying your beard then. I didn't. <laughs> I know. But, I probably should. But these people are now taking the influence and, 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 and running with it. And that's fine, man, because these guys ran with Otis Redding. You know, Paul Rogers ran with Otis Redding. Glenn ran with Stevie Wonder. You know, they're all running with these guys. And that's absolutely fine. You know, but what I'm missing what I am missing, with the exception of a couple of guys, you know, what I'm missing is something that's really exciting. And I, would, I go, oh, my God, that guy's just done something amazing, you know. And, 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 and sadly, everybody wants to be somebody else these days. And that's boring for me. Well, from my perspective, the things that last are the things that are unique. Okay, give me your top five unique uh, vocalists, songs, albums, vocalists, guitar players. Um, let's see here. So we'll we'll go vocalists. Okay, go on. Uh, probably my top five. Yeah, you gotta have be... it. Man, you, well, you know it. what? You know, I'm I'm one of those people, Doogie. My tastes are so divergent. That's okay. That I... I'm not. Yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not asking you to do anything different. Yeah, Difficult. but no. If, if, tell if, me. Tell me. Tell me who the five great 
greatest vocalist you have in your head right now? Uh, Nat King Cole. There you go. Uh, you, you mentioned Otis Redding. There you go. Um, uh, man, it's so hard, hard to, to narrow it down. Oh man, you're um, going to have to put these records on when you when you leave this interview. Who have you got? <laughs> what up yeah. to two? Uh, uh, Raul Malo from the Mavericks. I don't know if you're familiar with with them or not. No, but you know, uh, he, he's very uh, Orbison esque, and I mean, you know, I got to have Orbison on my list. There you go. You know, uh, so I mean, you, say, say for me, whatever my favorite is, it depends on what mood I'm in. You know, people yeah. say, well, what, what's your favorite album? Well, at, at one moment, you know, it could be, you know, uh, in a digital mood, the, the Dave Grusin's uh, Glenn Miller album. Okay. Or it could be, you know, uh, Aladdin Sane. <laughs> yes you know uh yeah so say it all it, it, it all depends on, on what particular mood i'm in so exactly. i mean but i'm somebody who's got you know at least like six thousand cds yeah. in my collection so i mean i walk around with about sixteen thousand songs on my phone <laughs> so uh so it but all depends it's like it truly it, it could be if, if i'm in a, you know in a country mood i could be you know listening to tom t hall oh you, you know, I, I, oh, I, I, I had a girlfriend a long, long time ago who was a big crunty fan, and 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 I just, I just got stuck in it, you know, and because it, because it's a kind of lyric that rock guys can't write, you know. I woke up in the morning and I found my house on fire. It doesn't work with metal. I mean, that would be, oh, metal is burning in the, th you know, it's just, it was just crazy. It was just crazy. But, all right, so you got, right, so we've done that. Let's do your five rock singers. And you don't have to include me because I know I shouldn't be in there even in the top 20. Right. But we'll start with Freddie Mercury. Okay. Right? And yep. we'll go through Ronnie Deal. Mm -hmm. And we'll go Robert Plant. And we'll go Ian Gillen. And then we'll go the combination of Coverdale Hughes. Am I wrong? You're not going to get an argument from me. <laughs> <laughs> but throw yourself in that mix too, just for good. No, measure. no, 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 no. I don't want, I don't want to be, I, I, I don't want to be, and I shouldn't be. I always found it more interesting to find out, you know, where people thought I came from, you mm -hmm. know, and they would go, oh, you got a wee bit of that, and and I do have a wee bit of that. Oh, you yeah. got a wee bit of this, and I go, oh yes, I do, because that's just what it was, man. It was great, it was glorious times, and I'm still enjoying it. And that's well. Here's the thing: if you, if you are passionate about music, yeah, you know, and you're making music, you can't but help. To have all those things, all those voices, all the songwriters, yeah, musicians that you really like influence what you do. Yes. I don't disagree. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, I'm passionate about singing. I'm, um, I love to sing. And, uh, and, and, and you were talking earlier about could I do something else? And yes, I probably could, but nobody'd care. So <laughs> I'll I'll be out I'll be out there with my loud Scottish voice going Rah! forever <laughs> until I can't do it anymore. And then and, and 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 then you know there'll be somebody else going up and going. Rah! <laughs> well, tell tell me this. He, uh, uh, you mentioned Ingve before. Yes, we you he had a uh, question that uh, they wanted to know if you had any uh, stories about shows that you had done when you were playing with him. Okay. I have to preface this with that I loved my time with Engby. I thought uh, he was great. Him and I got on so well together. He's rubbish at soccer, right? Blackmore, Richie was brilliant at soccer. Engby was not, but he would come round and pick me up at the hotel in his Ferrari, and we'd go to Starbucks, other um, uh, coffee shops are available, 
Um, and we'd go there and we'd play tennis for two hours. And he cheats. He's a cheat. <laughs> he's terrible. That was in. It was out. You know, he's terrible. But we always had, we always had good fun together, him and I. And uh, But like all these guitar players, these geniuses, these guys that he wants to keep himself fresh, the same way Richie and Michael do. And, and, and that's normally by changing the vocalist. Because you reach a point where you're like sick of the, what the sound of the voice is, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's just what happened. You know, he moved on to, to, to Ripper. And that was okay. That was good. He's moved on from Ripper to himself, which is maybe not as good. But we always got on fantastically well together. And, and, but he cheats at tennis. <laughs> you know, always, always. He, he he had a tennis court outside his house, and um, and and he always just cheated, and it was just, yeah. And he was the boss, so I just let him win. And then, I'd, <laughs> and but then I'd show him just how um how good my backhand was, and he would be upset, you know. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll be going home. But <laughs> but I let I let I worked with Ingvy for seven and a bit years. And I lived through three or four hurricanes with him, and it was and and it was devastating. You know, some of the stuff was devastating that came on, and 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 I, and I just was holed up in a hotel somewhere, you know. Uh, but it was crazy. It was always crazy. But I like I, I liked him very much, you know. But um, I hope he's doing well. I haven't I haven't heard anything from him for years. Yeah, and we don't speak anymore. You know, more his choice than mine. I don't well, know. It, it was that oh, backhand, what, Doogie. Just, what's that? It was that backhand. <laughs> yeah, the back. Well, the backhand. It was. It was really good. It was a double backhand right down the line. You know, and <laughs> and and he couldn't get it. <laughs> and he, he he used to say to me, "Don't do that again. <laughs> I'll show you how to do it. You do it like this." He's like, "Don't do that again." So it was fine. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. <laughs> As as we're talking about that about yeah uh, Ingve, uh, I've always found that metal and classical music they have a lot of similarities yeah. in song structure uh, on it. Yeah. And Unleash the Fury has got yeah. a couple songs on there that really represent that. Yeah, if you get a and Crown of Thorns. Now, okay. uh, what? Where do you or why do you think or the or where did the inspiration? You know, why those two are similar, I guess I should say. I never, I, when I joined up with Ingve, we decided I would not write anything. And that's what he said to me. He said, look, I've had problems with singers over the years. Here's the deal. I'll pay you to sing the album. I'll pay you to come on tour. But you're getting, I'm, I'm going to write everything. I thought, okay, that sounds like fun. Because I was working with Steen Morganson from, and we had a band together called Cornerstone. So I was doing that, and that was getting my writing things out. We did um, five albums together, four studio albums and one uh, live album, and and I just went in, and 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 he was very Ingve was very much. English is not his first language, so I'd say, well, no, it's, just, it's not quite that. Forget it. Sing it anyway. And so I'd sing it, and then the next day I'd come in and he changed it to what I suggested, just to, you know, a little kid is a baby goat. <laughs> you know, a little kid is not somebody in diapers running down the street. That's a child, you know. So we had these kind of moments. Um, but it was always good. I always just got on with him, and I just, you know, he, we worked very well together. He was a lot of fun to be around, and we enjoyed it, you know, until the point, again, a bit like Richie, where it just didn't work for him anymore. It was like, mm -hmm. okay, that's fine. See you later. <laughs> on to the next thing. Yeah, next thing. Yeah. Come on. Well, I'll tell you, what, one of your next things is uh, Long Shadows Dawn. Yes. Let's talk about that in, in okay. uh, that new album. Okay. Well, of course, the um, I was supposed to start in March in Japan with Michael Schenker. 
and we were we had nine months worth of work. We were, we were going to do Japan for two and a bit weeks, and then go off and do this and that, and 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 festivals with Maiden and Kiss and that, and and an and American tour, and end up in October in South America, you know, playing Colombia, uh, uh, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and somewhere else. And but of course, the the virus came in and killed that like that. So <clears throat> I had nothing to do. And so Frontiers, who are the record label that have put um this album out, we've been dancing around each other for a long time. And uh the and, and they always had an idea of me working with their in-house writers, and I didn't like that, you know. I mean, these guys are really good, but it's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something different. And 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 so they hooked me up with Emil Norberg, and he's a great guitar player and writer from um, from Sweden. And as soon as I heard what he was doing, I thought, right, we can do this. So I signed a three-album deal. <laughs> I might not, but so we did that, and we recorded the album over sort of three month, four month period, writing it, and recording it, and it's great. It's called Isle of Wrath. the The project's called Long Shadows Dawn because I woke up one morning, and I could see people shouting in the audience, "LSD, LSD, LSD." I could see that happening, and I just thought that was funny. But it's a great album. It's a great album, and I, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Probably the best album I've done in the last five or six years. You know, bad take, man. Let's let's talk about some of the songs on there. Uh, okay. Master of Illusion. Master of Illusion. Master of Illusion. Um, I liked it. Right. Unfortunately, it's going to be dictated to. Um, it's, uh, by the video that accompanies it. And I hate that video. And I'll say that publicly. I thought it was I thought it was cheap and demeaning and shocking and I hated it. The song is worth more than that. And um the song's great. The song's about you know a, a, an artist or a magician or an actor who goes out just to have that one more last hurrah. You know, and 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 no, a bit like a bit like a boxer that goes out there and thinks, "Oh my God, I can whip Mike Tyson's ass," you know. And of course, and of course, the first time you get punched in the face, you go, "Oh, maybe I can't." <laughs> so it was, so was kind of like that. It was, it, it was, it was, it was about people not realizing that it was over, and don't do it again. And and so that's what it was. Um, unfortunately, the video and and I mean I'm sorry I have to say this, but unfortunately the video was, I it, I, I hated it. I hated it. I've watched it twice, and I would never rip. I, what I've always said is 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 put the video on if that's where you are on YouTube. Switch the the vision off and listen to the song. The song's great. The video is awful. Well, the the video doesn't match what you just said. The song is about. It's just, it's, it, it's, no, it's got nothing to do with it at all. Nothing yeah. to do with it. And, 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 it, and, and, but, you know, I'm not in charge. And, and your not. other, your other favorite song, come on, we're going, we're on a roll. I'll tell you what, how about, how about Raging Silence? Raging Silence is a great song. Um, I, I, that was the second song we wrote, and I just feel it that it's it's got energy, passion, and 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 power behind it. Because we all feel that underneath us, don't we? We feel that, you know, that wave, that surge of of oh, and that was really it, really. And I just thought that's great. I wouldn't have called it Rage and Silence, but it ended up being, that was the that was the what title. <laughs> <laughs> but we always make we always make mistakes, you know. We always make mistakes, but I think it's a great song. 
there's not a song in that album actually, Michael, that I don't like. Yeah. You know, they, they, you know they're you know they're covering they're covering dementia, they're covering alcoholism, they're covering um, um, depression and loneliness. You know, and hopefully as we go through the album, you know, if you listen to Hallelujah, brother. Mm -hmm. You know, that's about a mate of mine that used to turn up pissed at my door at three o'clock in the morning or phoning me. And they're going, come on, let's go drinking. It's like, no. And it was all to do with... It, 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 the album's about reflection, really. There was a lot of reflection going on only because I had nothing else to do. Yeah. Well, how about Steel Town? Steel Town. Well, Steel Town, Bertie's like a junkyard saving his stuff, right? Because he wants to. When I moved to London, there was a guy next door called Bertie, and he was from Jamaica, right? He was a black Jamaican guy. And he loved my voice. He was like, oh, Dougie, you sound so great. Oh, why don't you sing some Caribbean music? You know? Right? But he lived in a house. And he collected things, shoes, right? He would collect shoes. I don't know where he got them, but he would collect them. And he had no carpets in his house. It was all tar down there. He had no heating in his house. It was a, it was a, a, a paraffin heater. Now, we were okay with that until his house went in fire, um, Bertie. And we had to go in and rescue him. Right, we had to drag him out, it's smoldering, you know, because we had no idea what was happening, and and but it, but it was all so that the Bertie thing was about him. Lizzie was the bar was the barmaid in in the local town, who who we all loved. If that's not inappropriate, right? <laughs> and you know, and it's and it was just a wee it was just a wee story going through, apart from Bertie, it was just a wee story going through. Uh, the steel town that I grew up in was called Motherwell. And they, and they had all these beautiful buildings, but rather than fix them, they, they tore them down and put up skyscrapers, which, you know, these buildings had been up for 100 years, and the skyscrapers lasted less than my life now. Mm -hmm. You know, they went up in the early 60s, they were down by the mid-80s. So that's what that's all it was. It was just a love song to the to the town I, keep, I grew up in. Gotcha. Well, yeah, as we're coming up on the, the, the end of our time here, Doogie, I want to make sure that we talk about the as yet untitled solo project. Okay. So tell us about that. Well, well, I got the I I, I got the rights to the album back. I recorded it after I left Engvies Band. And Sherinian, Derek Sherinian said, you should really just do a solo album. So I did. And I involved all my friends. I've got Neil Murray from White Snake and Black Sabbath. I've got Tony Carey from Rainbow. I've got Patty Russo, who you know, right, from mm -hmm. Meatloaf. I, I, I just got a whole bunch of friends that I'd built up over the years, and we just went in and recorded uh, 12 or 15 songs. It did nothing, nothing at all. No one cared. And um, then they came out and they, I got the rights back and, and, and Store for Music said, would you like to re-release it? And I said, yeah, of course. That'd be great. And we had two bonus songs. And again, the second bonus song is called Small Town Saturday Night, which is the tag on to Steel Town because it's about the rock club we went to, the Heathery Bar. And then it turned out that um, the the record company owned the rights to all these tribute albums I had done with a bunch of other people as well. It wasn't just me. And so they put twelve songs together, and 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 and, and so we just we just released it as an interesting double package. I mean, it's all been remastered. It's it, it's full on, and it's a nice introduction. You know, the, that kind of music doesn't get old. You know, right. you you listen to Highway to Hell now, you know, and it's 40 years old. It doesn't sound any different now, does it? It's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of that's the kind of music that I really like, you know, because it's not done by trends, you know, it doesn't have that that 
syndrome thing that they all had in the 80s or whatever the horrible chords or you know what i mean and all everybody well, listening knows exactly what i mean well there are certain records that sound of their time don't they you know you hear it you could pretty much guess okay that that record came out 1987 there you go yeah. yeah. Uh, but as we said before, the unique stuff, that's the stuff that stands the test of time. I agree. I yeah. agree. So. Even if even if the majority of journalists don't agree, that's they know it. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell, tell you what, that, Dookie, there what's was that sleeve behind you there? That one oh, over your left shoulder. This that is Ivy Pete and his Limbo Maniacs with their classic album, Limbo. There's promotion. <laughs> we, we will, sometimes we will just put up an album just to see if anybody notices what it is. Okay, I just yeah. did. And, you know, because uh, Ivy Pete and his Limbo Maniacs are not probably at the top of too many people's you know playlist, so we thought it would be interesting to put up. That's great. Good for you. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> so, but to anyway, see, you, you too. I'll tell you what. Uh, there's so much more we didn't didn't get to. So hopefully in the future you'll have time to uh, join us again. Of course. Of course. All of course. right. Sounds good. I'm going to go and play golf now. <laughs> Do you play golf? No, I don't because I I I, I was a caddy in my youth. Oh right, okay. And you know my my angst towards the uh, you know, the uh, all of the uh, all the abuse I took as a caddy, okay, <laughs> has has made me avoid the game. Oh, so although should, at times you, you should bring the abuse and treat younger caddies better, <laughs> and, and see go. it wasn't and and do that thing. It's all right for you. It wasn't like that in my day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell you what, we have had uh, Doogie's website and uh, YouTube right. channel and Jesus. all sorts of stuff scrolling throughout the show. So uh, anybody you know, with uh, wants to know more, you can get all things Doogie at DoogieWhite.com. Uh, you've got the official uh, Doogie White official fan page on Facebook that you can go to. So check it all out. Uh, you'll enjoy it, Doogie. And I, know you you, and I know you don't like it, but you know what? There you go. <laughs> I'm off to the shops now, <laughs> and then golf. <laughs> the The website hasn't been updated since 2014. Oh, okay. So, well, when you can get there, you I'll get all much, things Doogie up to 2014. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you man you too all awesome. right everybody I want to thank you for, for watching doogie thank you for being here everybody have a good night thanks a lot bye-bye this has been music night at the majestic with michael boswell if you enjoyed this edition of music night at the majestic follow us on facebook youtube twitter instagram and at musicnight.net Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content, without the express written consent of Starliner Media, is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time. For Music Night at the Majestic, this is your announcer speaking.